recognized symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the greatest professional wrestler of all time, and your friend and mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, Conrad Thompson. How we doing, pal, from a rainy, dreary, kind of very overcast spring day here in uh, Hendersonville, Tennessee. Uh, is it raining down at your place? Have you heard the words about old El Nino? No, El, El, what, no, whatever. Some kind of rainy season. You heard that talk? No, I, I, I know that it's raining every freaking day for like a week. Is what That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of rain I mean, here, but, uh, it's happening at your place at my house and in Florida, like my, my place in the panhandle, like rain everywhere for the yeah. seven days straight. Like, are you going to, when do you start building an arc? Telling you, man, the lake is up quite a bit, pal. Uh, but, uh, all good, man. I mean, ours is down. Huh? Is it really? Is it down? Yeah, our water's down. I See, mean, it might not be in a week. We'll check back, you know. Yeah, exactly, the water levels. But uh, no, pretty fired up today. Lots and lots of good stuff going on, Conrad. And pardon the pun, my world. Baseball um, is opening days right around the corner. Our man, Mr. Eric Bischoff, is going to be there for opening night. Let's just say AEW business is rocking and rolling, if you will. Lots of, uh, man, there's a lot of chatter online quite a bit, wouldn't you say? And house rules events, uh, rolling the light along. And tell you what, I may just go to the Briscoe Farm and do a little more work. Oh, I look forward to that. Well, don't forget, next what weekend. Mood, what kind of mood are you in today? Let's just, I'm in a good mood. Are you? Yeah. Not ornery. I'm not ornery. No. Okay. You, have oh, you well, eaten? I did. I just <laughs> ate with my, my dad and, uh, and a guy at the office, uh, not too long ago. You better not have gone to G's. I did not go to G's. We had food delivered today. We we're on a skeleton crew on a Friday up there. Everybody's tr had made plans to go do fun stuff. And then maybe they got a little rain. So, uh, yeah, we're recording on a Friday. We normally record. On a Monday morning today, it's a Friday afternoon. So a little different, but, uh, what's not different is double J is moving tickets. Tickets are on sale now. A E W T I X next weekend, believe it or not, ready or not double or nothing will be here. And you know what that means yet again, <laughs> Jeff Jarrett's going to add some gold to his treasure trove. Uh, I can't wait until, uh, what two weeks from now. And one of those titles behind you, it won't just be the intercontinental title. It won't just be the NWO or NWA 10 pounds. It won't just be the big gold. It'll be the doggone AEW tag straps, daddy. You getting si excited, nervous, anxious? You ready for it? Conrad, would you put that on your bingo card that we would even be talking about AEW gold in uh, May of 2023 and the last outlaw? There's no way. There's no freaking way. After you murdered a grandpa in a parking lot last year, I, I quit doubting <laughs> you. Oh, Conrad, how far we've come. Just how far we've come. Big show announced for Boston. Of course, Wembley tickets still on sale. And, uh, man, you're going to be in my neck of the woods first weekend of June. Huntsville getting a little AEW action in just a couple of weeks. Pick up your tickets now, AEWTIX. Speaking of tickets, our boy, Dave Meltzer. Mm. Wrote in the observer this week, quote, uh, as best we can tell the prior record for the largest crowd by a non WWE promotion was a WCW show that drew 16,318 in Manchester in 2000 for Booker T versus Jeff Jarrett, which was not a sellout, but a great crowd impact drew 8,100, the biggest crowd in the history of that company in 2009 at Wembley arena with Jarrett versus Kurt Angle as the main event. So Tony Khan, if you're listening and we know you are, and thank you for listening, Mr. Khan. <laughs> it sounds like we got the whole main event buttoned up. It's Jeff Jarrett in search of an opponent. I mean, you've done it for TNA. You've done it for WCW and now you've done it for, for AEW. Just Listen, bravo, Mr. Jarrett. Would you stop it? Hey, that, uh, seriously, when you think about Manchester, the, uh, arena is huge, nice building, but. Think about that stat that we gave about uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, one year uh, 
the, the yep. growth, whatever it is in the following year. But WCW, that was, uh, we had great TV or whatever. Turner had fantastic TV at the time. Uh, but what would you say? Me and Booker T, 16,000 in, in um, Manchester. That's 16,318 fans 23 years ago. Conrad, then- can, can, let me just ask this. Do you know how much picture money you can make off 16,000? <laughs> Do you know how much picture money you can make off 60,000? That's where we are. The rumor in the window is it's set for 74,000. I think you guys get there. I mean, you're already in the 60s and you haven't announced the doggone thing yet. Mr. Khan, I plead with you. Let's sell it out. Let's announce Jeff Jarrett in the main event. That's what the people, the people demanded, Jeff. Oh, there it is. Well, you- there it is. See, I- now a lot of people. <laughs> have had a lot of fun and they think that we made this poster. This is right out of the AEW graphics department. Jeff oh, Jones, sent me there. you're going to get, get heat on me. You're definitely going to get heat on me now. Do you think for well, a moment, the historic, I mean, think about that. That is cool. Well, the whole thing shaping up. Like you said, no matches, no talent, AEW, the brands on sale. It's uh we've got a, as they say in the ticket business, we got a hell of a runway. We've got the rest of this month, all of June, all of July, and then into August. So as the momentum continues to build, Wembley 100, just kind of the, um, gosh, uh, what is it? The, the acronym of fearing missing out? It, it's, uh, it, it is very prevalent. I will say that my timeline, uh, both on, on social media and on my WhatsApp uh, threads, um, it's kind of surreal to me, Conrad. It it really is. There's some big shows in Canada, so that's an international date. But the Wembley thing, kind of, it's it's a it's a bucket list of all bucket list items for me to be a part of that. Um, again, you know, folks in in this country, Madison Square Garden, uh, the old Boston Garden. Uh, I was a part of that event, the very first last. Uh, I mean, the last wrestling event in the old Boston Garden. We're going to the new one. Uh, that mania was held there, but there's a couple of mid South Coliseums always will be special to me. The forum, which we got to go back in, uh, earlier this year, uh, a lot of bucket list arenas, but Wembley stadium, if they don't, don't sell another ticket, 60,000 is incredible. But like I said, we got three and a half months. So yeah, I am super fired up. So got to stay in the gym, Conrad, and got to stay away from G's. That's for sure. Dude, I saw, uh, on social media, if you haven't followed Jeff on social, you should, I guess your personal trainer, uh, Cody or Corey or whatever his name is posted it. And you, you shared it, dude, you you got them, them Hulkster pythons going right now. Look at you. (laughs) Oh, Corey's pushing me, man. I, uh, there's definitely a love hate relationship between me and Corey. I love to hate him, but no, he, he does. It, It is something about, uh, just turning it over. I walk through there and say, all right, Corey, what are we doing? I don't have to think about it. I just kind of follow it, but it pays dividends, man. I'm, uh, I will say this. I am training very, very hard. Well, we can tell, let me ask you something though. As we were talking about Wembley, it dawned on me, you know, you had, you worked some really big crowds in the WWF and then you worked a handful of really big crowds in WCW. This Wembley show, this will be the biggest crowd you've worked in front of now. Oh gosh. By, I mean, leaps and bounds. I mean, yes. I mean, that's awesome. I'm, I'm excited for that. It is, you know, in the nineties, there weren't stadium shows and, um, you just kind of look at where the industry's at, um, it, it, running back to back nights. That's, I don't say unheard of 30 years ago. I, I mean, I, I'm not, but you know, it's just rare, but WWE did back to back nights in Puerto Rico and. Right. On Friday night. No, what did we do in San Francisco just a couple of weeks ago? Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, yep. three, yep. uh, same market. So just where the industry's at uh, it is amazing. Uh, what a statement. Um, SummerSlam last year in Nashville, you know. Hey, by the way, since we're talking about Nashville, I wanted to ask you about this because it certainly looks as if WrestleMania might be coming to Nashville in 2027. And when I saw that report on the internet, I said to myself, self, Jeff Jarrett works for AEW. Do they not want to sell tickets? Like oh, God. they're a day late and a dollar short on that deal. But the road dog was never short. Now he's our topic today. Uh, this is, I guess is, uh, 
a continuation of a conversation you started yep. with Road Dogs podcast co-host, friend of the show, Mr. Cassio Kid. You guys were able to chat a little bit about Road Dog when I was on the mend last year. And now we're going to pick up right where we left off. When you returned to the WWF in 1997, Jesse James is transforming into the Road Dog. So the former roadie, now he's the Road Dog, Jesse James. What was your relationship like when you joined back up with the evil empire here in 1997? You know, and, and I thought about this when I was looking at the research, just how, you know, our fathers, uh, when I look back on those old Memphis cards and I knew my dad, Jerry Jarrett and bullet Bob Armstrong had worked together through the territories. And, you know, one time bullet owned part of, uh, the Southeastern territory. So me and Brian really grew up. Uh, there's a lot of similarities and, you know, I've talked about me and Owen similarities, but when you grow up the, the son of not only a wrestler, but also a, a promoter slash wrestler. So me and me and Brian from the very first time we met and we met uh, again, I'd seen a little bit of him in Smoky mountain. Um, her, obviously, you know, knew Brad, Scott and Steve, and certainly, and, and heard of bullet and my dad always talked fondly of, of, of bullet. But when we hook up in, uh, into 94 at WWF off of Brian's audition, legit audition in front of Vince and Bruce and a few others. And then they put us together. Um, you know, as 30 years has rolled along, a lot of folks think, man, the road dog double J and the road dog, we were on camera only on camera together seven months, but we immediately hit it off. Uh, I, I think the second night, uh, we were together, we started traveling together and essentially I can say 90% of the time we were on shows together, we traveled together. It's just one of those deals. We instantly connected. So, uh, in 95, when, when we went our separate ways from the WWF, uh, and I went back for that short period of time and then went to WCW, you know, Brian worked here in the territory, stayed at my house, moved into my house, uh, from time to time. Uh, and then, you know, he was, that's where he met his wife, Tracy in, in Memphis. Um, and so he had done his thing. And then when he got his opportunity to go back to the WWF while I was in WCW and he was the real double J, I was super happy with him uh, just for the opportunity. And then, you know, that didn't go as, as he had hoped or, or they had a hope or none of them had hoped. Uh, and so w w when I returned, it, we picked up as far as traveling partners, kind of where we had left off. Uh, and so did we talk every day during that little hiatus when I was at WCW? No, but was, you know, I I'll say from the day we met, certainly in the, few weeks after that we became good to great friends to you know become best best of friends so to speak we um we got to talk about just the the presentation and the transformation because your pal got an opportunity here after being an enhancement guy over in wcw to be the roadie for you and be your second and then he tried to do that real double j and Man, he just sort of floundered a lot of 97, but when they pair him with Billy Gunn, they're off to the races before you know it. And, and by early 1998, they become full fledged members of DX and man, he's just printing money from that point forward. But I think nobody probably would have predicted that for these guys as singles acts in 97. Certainly they both had been successful in their own right and become, you know, contracted television wrestlers, which is damn half the battle. But to now just, I mean, listen, even compare your experience in 1998 to his, whew, you got to be proud for your friend here, man. The new age outlaws, they were changing the game. I mean, big time. And, uh, you know, the, the thread of this entire podcast will be, and I'll say it a couple of times to me, just how talented of an individual Brian is, uh, but even Brian couldn't get over the, the, the double J character in the attitude era. It, that, to me, that's one of the early things in research and going over this that popped out of it is, is that the real double J in the early attitude era, it just didn't fit. You know, the NWO is hot on the other channel. 
Stone Cold, the early days uh, of that. And then all of a sudden, the roadie, which was cool. And, man, Double J got was hot, and Bruce producing me in those vignettes and the storyline with Razor and all that. I was – I'll say I was rolling along cooking. But the day they put a roadie with me, it fat – it, it fit the gimmick so well. Brian enhanced the box office package literally overnight. Well, fast forward a couple of years, look at Brian and Billy, you know, floundering, if you will. But did they come up with this stick, if you will, that just fit with the Attitude Era and the New Age Outlaws and Brian's creative mind? And obviously, I think he's one of the greatest – uh, promos for, for that attitude generation that you had to kind of mesh uh, catchphrases, not only mesh catchphrases, but some storyline, and then you got to make it entertaining. And above everything, you got to do it in 90 seconds or 65 seconds or 70 seconds. You know, in the territory days, Lawler or Idol or Dusty Rhodes or Ric Flair, or, I mean, I could go on and on and on. They had three, three and a half minutes, four, four and a half minutes, whatever. I mean, a lot longer. Brian had the ability in 90 seconds to just, I mean, magnetic personality and knew how to, knew, knew how to make it work. So, bingo. Attitude era, the right gimmick, the right guys. They immediately, and I've said this, and we'll, we'll get into kind of the DX conversation. And I know Eric said that, uh, I'll let you say it, but I think Bischoff said a couple of weeks ago that the 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 kind of the, the straw that stirs the drink. My bad. There it is. Straw that stirs the drink of of X Pac moving into DX. I can see where it fit the gimmick and the the attitude, but Brian's creativity and his catchphrases and his look with the braids and everything that goes with it. I've said for years. Brian put the X in DX. I've, I've yes. said that many times. Well, I mean, just, uh, as crazy as it sounds, you know, the, the ramp is what did it, you know, like just this year, what we've seen with AEW, I guess last year as well with the acclaimed man, they got over so big and it felt like that was borrowing a page from the new age outlaws and the road dog. I mean, him coming to the ring and doing his spiel that became one of the things that everybody looked forward to the most on the show. And it got a crazy pop and the whole crowd is doing it along with him. I mean, that's something that musicians really strive for. Yep. And he's doing it night in night out. And think about that. These people watch the television show, go out of their way to buy tickets, adjust their schedules, pay for parking slip all the kids in, get everybody in their spot, maybe pick up the merch, all that. They're here to see wrestling. But one of the things they're most excited about is they want to do this sing along with road dog. How crazy is that? And you pick any of your favorite artists and you look at their set list and they're going to open hot. They're going to play their hits and all that. But about three quarters of the way through the show or halfway through the show, they kind of bring it down and you can kind of hear the backbeat. You kind of hear the rhythm of this song coming and you know, what's coming. It's, Garth Brooks, Friends in Low Places. I mean, you could come up with every hot artist that's really headlined arenas. They have their one, two, maybe three sing-along uh, hits. When Brian's music hit, when they were red hot as the outlaws, people knew every word and knew every his cadence and how he was going to do it, and they loved to be a part of it, and it, you know, there was a point they had seen this year, year and a half, two years to, to this day, they'll still join in. And that's what was pretty cool. You know, in 2018 or whenever 16, I think when they came back, that's 20 years removed and they're still word for word for anyway. Yeah. He, he has, I've, you know, we talk about it often on the podcast, the emotional connection with the audience without question. He has it. They live vicariously through the road dog. What's crazy too is in real life, the real life, Brian James is one of the most charismatic and witty dudes you could meet, like just super sharp wit and, and, uh, and a silver tongue devil. But I don't even know that that all came through because the rap was largely the same every time. Um, and, and, and just think about, 
I'm not trying to diminish his in-ring skills, but I am saying when people think about road dog, they think about that more than anything else. Maybe oh. they think about the dancing or the doggy style pump handle slam, but like so much of wrestling today is this guy does that move. That guy does this move and road dog got over talking into a mic, walking into the ring, which if he wanted to, he could do today. I mean, he could walk to the ring and do that rap today and it would still get a huge reaction. Like, yes, that to me is something that should be studied and, and, and analyzed by people who are trying to make a living in the business. This guy didn't have to do a crazy this or that or whatever. Just man, what a way to do it. Right. It's genius. It, it is genius, but you, you have to have the charisma. You just, yes. that's it factor. It, not everybody can do it. Brian is yes. gifted. I've, I've often said it. And you know, when you, and look, everybody in DX, I'm not diminishing any of that, but there are certain things that Brian did subtly and sometimes not so subtly. The skits, the nation of domination skit, the, I mean, you know, the LOD promos or whatever. Brian, I mean, back to the roadie days, Brian had a creative brain. I mean, night one or two, he said, uh, hey, I got to go find me a little pin flashlight because he walked around backstage and started asking, hey, uh, what do roadies do? And he had to, you know, ask a couple of folks, hey, they do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. Well, Brian, in his creative brain, all right, he put this character together. He did the exact same thing as the New Age Outlaws. All right, this is this deal, and we're going to do this in ring. He's just super creative. His his brain doesn't think. And look, I, I know sometimes his uh, I've heard, and we've had a couple of chats, and I'm like, now what did you actually say? Because he's like, yeah, some people are, you know, whatever the the backlash that you know matches, and we, me and you've been talking about that off and on. But you know, Br Brian doesn't think tackle drop down hip toss. He's thinking catchphrase zinger uh, this guy needs to cut me i mean he kind of thinks in the money spots as opposed to the performance spots as far as the the, the in-ring work that's how his brain works creatively well you uh when you hook back up with him or when you join back up with the uh, world wrestling federation not too long after he becomes a tag team champion when he and billy gunn beat the legion of doom this is his first major championship and it's the WWF tag team title. The same titles that so many great teams through the years held the British Bulldogs, the heart foundation for a night, the rockers demolition, Arn and Tully. I mean, there's so many great ones, just one after another. And now he's on that list. And when you take a look at what's in the not so far back rear view mirror, uh, he was maybe going to be a protege for the honky talk man. And now he's beating the freaking road warriors for the tag titles. Like the little kid in him had to be just ecstatic with that. You know, to pull it back just a little bit, Conrad, to me, it's kind of the music, uh, magic, uh, of, of how our music is written in professional wrestling. This song didn't work and that sound didn't work. You can call it the real double J or whatever it may be. What didn't work. Then all of a sudden they put him and Billy together. It clicked a little more when they were crowned tag team champions. I don't think there was a member of the roster, a member of the office, a member of production or, a, a, you know, 95% of the crowd that didn't say it's about damn time. They became tag team champions because they were over. I mean, it was, it, but it's, it's one of those things that I think it's a lesson for today that if something's not working, don't double down on it, shift gears and do something that will work. I mean, they were on the same TV, uh, with the same exposure and what was Billy rockabilly. Yeah. So rockabilly and the real double J how long did it take Conrad a year, maybe less, even out of less a year, than, less than, okay, th there you go. There's a lesson to be learned in less than a year. Their career went from treading water at best to the best tag team in the company. And talk about drawing money. And you had the, the good fortune of working with them. They did a couple of house shows in December of 1997 in Tennessee and little rock. Uh, and the King's going to be involved. Cause of course he is. Uh, were you having fun working with, uh, with Brian on these shows? And that's when, yeah, me and Lala were, it was a little bit difficult because 
we were baby faces in Memphis, uh, I, I believe, but in reality, it's the, the new age. I'm trying to think that the, the dynamic of it all, but look, when you work with Brian and, and Billy, it's, they both can work and they both, um, you know, how I feel about booking and tag teams. I, I just think they're, they're, they're limited to a certain degree. Uh, Brian and Billy are very, very different promos in ring work personalities on and off camera. They're just two different people, but it's one of those things when you put them together, one plus one doesn't equal two. They've got incredible chemistry and the people know it. It's uh it's fun to think about this time because, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about your formation of, uh, this new character as you come together with Tennessee Lee in 1998 and add Southern justice to the, uh, to the, uh, the presentation. But at some point through the year, you're going to be feuding with X-Pac, which kind of means you're feuding with all of DX. And eventually it comes around to where you and uh, dog have your first ever singles match, September 14th, 1998. And I'm sure before you did that, you were making sure you were all manscaped up in the back. Uh, as I understand it, you and road dog used to shave each other's back, but now you'd have the right tools for the job. Thanks to our friends at manscaped. Friends and family and loved ones, I bet you haven't purchased a Father's Day gift yet, have you? Not to fear, the leaders in Below the Belt Grooming are here. I'm talking about our friends at Manscaped. They're saving the day yet again with the total package for the father figure in your life. It's time to upgrade his game from waist to face with this exclusive offer. Have him join the 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped. And get 20% off plus free shipping with the promo code MYWORLD at manscaped.com. We'll start it out with the Father's Day MVP, the Performance Package 4.0. Inside the package, you'll see the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the brand new Weed Whacker 2.0 ear and nose hair trimmer, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver Toner, the Performance Boxer Briefs, the Travel Bag to hold all the goodies. And how about the Money Maker? Manscaped has changed the game with their Beard Hedger Pro Kit for dads all around the world. You get the Beard Hedger Trimmer, the shampoo and conditioner for your beard, the Beard Oil, the Beard Balm, and two free gifts, a beard comb and some scissors. And we all know dads love their comfort. Well, if the grooming routine is already dialed in, make sure to hook him up with the boxers. The Manscaped Boxers 2.0, without a doubt, the best boxers for men of all ages. Whether you're mowing the lawn or taking out the trash or golfing in the sun, these are moisture wicking boxers that breathe without breaking a sweat. Get 20% off plus free shipping when you use the promo code MYWORLD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code MYWORLD. Make this Father's Day one he won't forget with Manscaped. By the way, if you've never given Manscaped to your dad or an uncle or a grandpa, I highly recommend it. When an old timer opens something up, it says manscaped on it. He starts thinking about, did my son, did my nephew, did my cousin, did they just buy me something to trim my balls? We sure did manscaped.com. Uh, so listen, September 14th, 1998, it's a Monday night raw from San Jose and you're going to get the win. Of course you do three God. minutes, five seconds. Your reads. Uh, I just got to say that I, I just, I, your reads are, I mean, it just. They're just kind of unparalleled in all of television and um, <laughs> radio and in podcasting. You know, I've been a manscaper since 86. How long have you manscaping? Uh, I think I first started shaving my balls down real good in 2000. <laughs> That's when I learned about pulling them tight. When did you learn about pulling them tight, Jeff? Folks that, that are tuning in <laughs> to my world, did you think you <laughs> I mean, you asked the question. I'm just here to answer them. Uh, so when did you learn about pulling them tight? Did Jerry tell you to pull them tight? Who taught you to pull them tight? 86. No, but I'm saying like, you know, pulling them tight. That's a trick. Like you do it the wrong way one time. And you're like, well, that, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> so when did you learn about pulling them tight? Did what somebody, did, did somebody smarten you up? I wonder if old Robert Fuller might've given me a, I know. I don't think Robert, let's not go there. Yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> Karen, uh, my friend, I love you, Connie. Love you too, buddy. Road Dog and Badass are going to do their uh, mic work before the match. And before the match, they show footage of Jarrett and Road Dog together when Dog was Jarrett's roadie. 
And they also showed Jarrett lip syncing with my baby tonight. About two and a half minutes in, Southern Justice comes to ringside. They attack Road Dog. Badass is going to knock out Dennis Knight with a guitar. And uh, back in the ring, you're going to destroy Road Dog with a guitar and score the pin. Meltzer would call it good action. So listen, uh, this once upon a time, no doubt about it, was supposed to be a pay per view show, a pay per view match. Like a few years prior, this been a this might have been like a second from the top on an in your house thing. I mean, there's a lot of time, effort, and energy invested. When we finally get it years later, we feel like we at least have to tip the cap. Do you do you think there could have been more done with it? I mean, could we have made this into another? I mean, why couldn't we just pick up where we left off a little bit? Well, here's <laughs> Derek. This is a shout out for you today. I didn't even know or realize till I read research that they actually did that because Conrad, they didn't that, you know, once the attitude era kicked in the tip to history, wasn't done back then. Like it is now it was, that was the new generation era. We're not even going there. I didn't even realize, and maybe, you know, it was a live show and maybe it was a last second decision. I think this is good B roll. Cause it does add to the story, but um, we were in such different places creatively double J and, and, and the roadie, it was almost, you know, in, in WWF land, two different characters, as opposed to, you know, uh, this double J and, and, and the road dog. Um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that, oh, Conrad, we've played the what ifs in, you know, in, in 1995, if, if, uh, if, if me and Brian would have walked out how would that have angle how would it have played out you know it, how you know the way the chairman wanted to go how would that have you know it was going to be a summer slam match and probably a return and i think there was you know different discussions on how to do it but you know vince wanted a singing cowboy and and you know what would that angle have looked like in 95 right would be interesting by 98 it was uh you probably got the time down there, a four minute TV match, five minute TV match, dude. It was so fast. I mean, yeah. yes, the B roll was longer than the match. Probably three minutes and five seconds. Okay. <laughs> That's the attitude era matches it with no finish. Probably. Yeah. Well, no, you clocked him with a guitar and he got, he counted the lights like he should. There you go. Now we're you, talking exactly what's going to happen in Wembley. Now we're talking. I, I, you just had to, you know, listen, he's got the tag team gold. He's strutting his hot shit. Everybody's doing his sing song nonsense. So I'm sure after you clocked his ass, gave him a little guitar necklace as he's counting the lights, you tapped him on the shoulder and said, Hey, get the bags. <laughs> you know, he's the roadie. <laughs> uh, so listen, I, I think it's cool that they showed this yes. uh, little tip of the cap, but man, I really do wish we could have just, we're doing pay-per-views every month. We could have did something here and then it winds up maybe with a six man at some point, I could see you teaming with Southern justice against three guys from DX. It could have worked. And you would have loved that. I mean, yeah. all six of us were buddies, uh, and working hard. And, you know, that's the thing. Brian is a very, very good ring gen general. Uh, right. That's just kind of one of his fortes. Anyway, carry on my man. Well, six, the six man happens two weeks later at the breakdown pay-per-view. Um, I would have liked to have seen it been a singles match, but Hey, we got it. 11 minutes and 18 seconds. Your guitar that day came out and said, don't piss me off. And uh, Meltzer says it totally takes away any edge. Jarrett might gain with his new gimmick by having him carry around a guitar with piss, not spelled out. I don't know. That seems silly to me. Like, were you disappointed in that? Or is this a toy thing? Like I got a, I was for a toy, right? It's, it, I, it's one of those things that, um, I learned later in life that it's called a mask, but I, I was in, I'm like, do what? Yeah. It's a TV thing. You cannot say, I think there's seven or eight words that you, Oh, the George Carlin rant. Yeah. But I, I just like, wh what are we talking about? We shot those vignettes and don't piss me off and this and that. And now all of a sudden I'm carrying out a guitar that's censored, you know, it, it, it just felt so off. It is, uh, in, in the seven dirty words that Carlin lists, it's the second word. The okay. first one is the S word. All right. Listen, what are we doing? It's shit. piss, 
F and then there's a C and then a C sucker and then an MF -er, and then boobies in a different way. Those are the words you can't say. Oh, I didn't know the, in a different way. It was one. I always thought, yeah, to get into it, but I, 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 I was told that, mm, gosh, not coming to me, attorney at WWF who wasn't coming to chastise me, but discussion. And he happened to be in the arena. And I said, can you help understand this? And he said, yeah, it's a, it's not just a standards and practices thing. Uh, isn't it FCC or wasn't it FCC? Thing? Yeah, that's right. There's seven words you can't say. They're obscene. Those are obscene words. And piss was one of them. And, and it, it bled from. Th those were certainly broadcast, but now cable primetime as well. You could not say it in primetime on cable. I think whatever it was so disheartening. It was just like, really? We're yeah. Yeah. I, what's crazy is a few years later, Aaron Anderson would actually be pissed on by stone cold. <laughs> so, you know, things change. You couldn't uh, say this here, but you could show people doing it on each other later. Well, whatever. Listen, this six man is fun. It's X-Pac and the new age outlaws against Jeff Jarrett and Southern justice. The crowd was totally into the outlaws and Meltzer would say it's amazing. The WWF would even tease breaking them up, given how over they are with these crowds right now. X-Pac sold during the body of the match, but made a comeback at eight and a half by reversing the Jarrett sleeper. Both men ended up down and crawling to their respective corner. X-Pac crawled to the wrong corner at first and then tagged Billy Gunn. X-Pac re-enters and gives Jarrett the Bronco Buster. Badass steals the guitar from Jarrett, but the refs stop him from, use it, uh, from using it. Jarrett takes the guitar and nails X-Pac with it. X-Pac covered his right eye. Meanwhile, Gunn gave Dennis Knight the rocker dropper for the win. The ref and the outlaws checked on X-Pac at ringside, who was still on his back, checking on his eye. He walked to the back on his own, but was in obvious pain. So a lot to unpack here. Um... I'm sure you enjoyed working with Sean Waltman. Once upon a time, he was referred to as like the measuring stick for talent in that organization. What was your experience like in the ring with him on the whole? Well, we've covered uh, this in the SummerSlam 98 in the hair versus hair match. So yes. this is kind of the dovetail of all of it or coming out of it that, um, you know, once uh, Tennessee Lee, you know, once we were going with the, uh, you know, new haircut, new attitude. Don't piss me off. I was so fired up. And then knowing that the kind of the, the, the groundwork was going to be me and, uh, uh, kid, uh, X-Pac, you know, we worked gosh around the world. I think we did a couple of European tours. We certainly did all over the country. Uh, but you know, we had our A, B and C match down. He was super, super over. And we just always had really, I did one of, I think it was hit podcast. We talked about, it was one of those things that we just had really, really good chemistry, very good chemistry and always did. So, um, he's super smooth, um, in, in, in a lot of way. I mean, just, and again, we're going back to an era that there was stone cold and then there was DX. And I know rocks in that conversation, but as far as baby face reactions and who's over with the crowd, they're stone cold in the, in DX. And those guys were red freaking hot. Talk to me about the Bronco buster, uh, of all the moves you've taken over the years. Uh, is that one of your least favorite? Where does that one rank? Do you like having Waltman's hog meat in your face? What was that like? <laughs> It got a hell of a reaction. So, no, it's easy to take. So, uh, you know, I'd love to hear his story. How did he come up with, hey, I'm going to sit you down in one corner and we're going to back, I'm going to back up to the other. And then I'm just going to dive at you and just give you a grand old tea bag. You know, how come, how come it wasn't called the Bronco tea bag? I don't think he could say tea bag on TV, maybe. That's hey, let me that's let me true. ask let me ask you this what would you have rather taken a bronco buster or the stink face bronco buster yeah 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 i think he'd probably i think that's probably, that's probably the right answer you, you kind of got tights there and it's a he, he he's hitting you in the chest so it's is that the only time is he the only guy who's given you that move i mean like when you worked indie shows would guys try to call that would that no. be something okay mm-hmm how come nobody, how come nobody else does that? Do you think? Right. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> you want, do you want to tell that story or nope. is that another time? That's for another time, but Here, look, here's, here's the, since we're just full inside baseball here and this is just for me and you, this is actually what it was here. 
you, 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 the first one was cutting eyes at me. And then yes. it's just like the Danny DeVito meme <laughs> and I'll never forget it. It was, Oh, I had to look over at my partners like, mm, Nope. <laughs> just the subtle. <laughs> It was almost as if it was like a serious card game. And they were asking, you know, are you in? <laughs> okay, uh, listen, let's talk about the uh, the errant guitar shot. You, you, you've had fun wrestling Waltman. It's a good match. Uh, you're taking the Bronco Buster. The fans are with it. The, your opponents are super over, so you guys have a ton of heat. And then he gets hurt with this guitar. What's uh, what's protocol? I mean, you've uh, that hurt. Walt Waltman, he's holding his eye, has to be oh. checked on help to the back, the whole I deal. Wonder, you know, uh, a couple of times throughout my career, and I, I don't know if we've done this, but I did, you know that show Blue Collar, Collar, Blue Collar Comedy Tour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that at center stage one night, Conrad, and I hit, is a stand-in, but I'm supposed to hit one of the comedians, and just the way I hit it, a little piece literally ricocheted off right up into my own eye. I went to Emory hospital and there was, it was a big to do for a while. Cause I thought it was going to be messed up, but, um, I must've got him in the eye. I, it, it, there was definitely nothing coming out the other side of it that he had. Uh, I don't know if his stitches, you know, I've busted um, several people through the years of they've ended up having to get stitches or sutured up or, I mean, or, or, uh, super glued up and all that, but I don't remember anything really, really bad that happened here. Well, eventually you get a haircut, uh, which we've talked about in the archives available now, my world on youtube.com. Uh, but with Mark Canterbury injured, the outlaws are going to defeat you and Dennis Knight in title matches on a couple of house show loops following the pay-per-view. And then you get another singles match with road dog this time on Sunday night heat. They give you two minutes and 35 seconds. You get a win again. Of course you do. Uh, during road dogs, usual intro stick was according to the torch. He referred to himself as the tag team champion of the world and said he represents that D and rolls to that rolls on that X, unlike the badass. And then he rolled out of the ring and high five Shane McMahon on commentary. Jim Cornette talked about Jarrett and road dogs history together. Road dog hit Jarrett with the guitar for the DQ, which sent Shane into a near orgasmic state. He hollered and cheered and then yelled swing better, better, better swing number 71. So Shane is doing commentary here on Sunday night. Heat. what'd you think of Shane as a color commentator? Didn't last long, but it was fun. I've said this many, many times. I used to tell Mike today and Don West, uh, for what it's worth, I believe you guys have the hardest job here tonight, uh, because you are having to piece together everything and about half of what's going to happen out there. Nobody knows because it's calling action and anything can happen. And, within certain limits. So, uh, I don't believe, uh, this was Shane's, uh, strong skill set, but I think it takes a special talent to be able to color commentate or, 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 or play by play. I mean, to, to be really good at it, it is, uh, it's not easy. So, uh, I think Shane would tell you it's not his strong suit either. Hey guys, need to call a quick time out here. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my listeners over at OU didn't know for a while now about all the cool things happening over at adsfreeshows.com. An all new mailbag series debuts later this month on Ad Free Shows as we pick the braid of a man who has spent 40 plus years in the wrestling business. Longtime WCW and WWE referee Nick Patrick answers your questions. And Kurt Angle. Where are you getting beer on it? Or me? No, no. It ended up being my own blood. Austin had, <laughs> had, had the title. It had the jagged edges on it, right? And they had a deal where, where uh, uh, Angle pulled me in, and I took a belt shot. A little bonus content comes your way, courtesy of the Kurt Angle Show. A dream match became a reality back in 2016 as Kurt Angle squared off against Cody Rhodes on the Independent. For the first time, Kurt watches back his match against the American Nightmare. This kid's really talented. He's selling the ankle here on the leapfrog, went down on it awkwardly. He's outside the ring talking to the referee. This is, like you said, all part of the match plan. Hey, start to show that weakness in the ankle. Yeah, yeah, this was uh, his idea to you know, make it look like he hurt his ankle so that when he did lose, <laughs> I love he had it. something to gripe about. 
Ad-free show members have chatted one-on-one with AEW stars like Eddie Kingston, Dax Harwood, Ricky Starks, and many more, including a recent live interactive session with Renee Paquette. He still continues to do that. He's on commentary in AEW. Um, So I think it was cool for him to kind of put on that analyst hat and get to kind of test out those waters a little bit. But end of the day, it was a thing that I think made him feel like, you know what? Wrestling can be okay again. I can have fun in the wrestling space again. And and now we have CM Punk Wrestling. So you're welcome. That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ads Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adsfreeshows.com. So you wind up taking the guitar shot here. Normally you're the one dishing them out. How was road dog? Did he take care of you on the guitar? Yes. Again, timing. He knows bat speed is everything. If you hold back. You're going to feel it a little bit worse. Uh, but it's fine. And on into, uh, 1999, you guys are going to, um, team up you and uh, Owen Hart to defeat the outlaws on the January 11th edition of raw from Houston. This is a number one contenders match. You get plenty of time too, based on the standard at the time, 10 minutes and 33 seconds and earns your tag title shot. Deborah tries to distract Billy Gunn standing on the apron. He tells her to suck it. Deborah then gets in China's face. Gunn jumps out, to separate them. Dog gets upset at Gunn. Owen rolls up road dog from behind for the pin. This could have been fun, man. You and uh, Owen teaming up for a long run with the outlaws. You did get a chance to do that a lot on the house shows and even in a triple threat with edge and Christian thrown into the mix. How fun were these? Um, Conrad, pull the picture back up, Marcus, for you, YouTube folks yeah. describe it. Uh, it is a picture of me and Owen and Deborah outside the ring. It's after a match and, uh, we win and victorious. Does that picture tell any story to you of me and Owen, uh, Conrad? I love that picture. You can tell you guys are big buddies. I like your little flat top haircut. You're sporting at the time. I love the nugget sign in the background, but the look on Deborah's face is maybe my favorite thing in the whole picture. Okay. Well, if you just hone in on me and Owen, that's a rib. Um, Owen would jump up on me and hold on to my neck and like, hold me, hold me, hold me as a rib. And he's like, all right, let's go up the ramp. Let's go up the ramp. So you try to put him down, but he just kind of holds on to you and he pushes down on your shoulder that you kind of like, okay, I got, Okay, I'll go along with it, Owen. I, I'm, I'm going to carry your 250 pound butter for it. He, he was heavy. Uh, so, anyway, but uh, to answer your question, teaming with Owen, it was always a blast. But to to have big hot crowds, Brian and Billy uh, at this time, Adam and Jay, you know, whether it's a, just a tag or a three way tag, um, just. I mean, it was stuff that, you know, you can come through the curtain and say, we get paid to do this and everybody worked snug and tight and, and laid everything in and you felt it and we all worked hard, but it was, you know, those are the kind of things that, um, that really make the business fun. Well, it had to be fun is you working with uh, road dog again, uh, on Sunday night heat, but this time the blue blazer is going to interfere. Uh, somehow road dog wins though. Uh, road dog attempts to give his intro, but Jared attacks him, disappointing the crowd. Owen comes to ringside. He attempts to interfere, but the blazer runs out and beats up both Owen and Jarrett. After the match, the blazer unmasks and reveals himself to be D'Lo Brown. Hey, this is kind of fun here. You know, you're getting to wrestle road dog working as a single. You're still getting to hang out with Owen, a little silliness, little Scooby-Doo action with the blue blazer stuff. This is fun stuff. And now this is spring of two of 99, I believe, uh, March of 99. Yeah. Yeah. So this is when we were telling the blue blazer story yes. that Owen saying it's not him and everybody leans toward, Oh, of course it's you Owen, but then, okay. A D low brand. We had multiple, um, Coco beware. I think Steve Blackman, we had a couple of folks ended up being under that blue blazer outfit. So yes. Uh, and, and D Lo, it was anyway, entertaining television. And as you notice, just how short the segments were, Conrad. Two minutes. Yeah, two minutes here. One at 59. Hey, I wanted to ask you about tag teams because 
really honestly, the New Age Outlaws are as over as a tag team could possibly be here. And we're going to start having the guys try their hands as singles competitors. I mean, Road Dog's going to become hardcore champ and then intercontinental champ. So he's, you know, moving up the ranks here, which I'm sure that's probably what he imagined for himself when he started wrestling, not necessarily as a tag team. I get that. But why would WWE try to even tinker with something that's working? It's been said over the years that Vince just wasn't a big fan of tag teams. And I've even heard some people say, from a P&L standpoint, you're paying twice as many guys. What do you think Vince thought or felt about tag teams at the time? Well, I think what you already look, folks listening, Conrad, you know, just more. Chat. That's it. I mean, Vince looks at monetizing, um, and he's not the only one, but you know, a, a talent is an asset. And so how do I get the best ROI? How do I get the very best return on investment? It, when you have a tag situation, um, it's, it's four guys out there at a minimum as opposed to two. So you're, you're doubling your expense, if you will. So you got to get double the ring or, 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 you know, return. If you're looking at the real micro look at it, creatively speaking, you, to me, you can't have seven single matches or eight single matches. You got to have some tags. You got to have variety. You got to have a mixed tag. You got to, or whatever it may be. So, um, but as things progressed along that, you know, you, you kind of look at the guy who's, I, I think the easiest way to say this is, is if I'm putting on my promoter cap, not necessarily a creative cap, but a promoter cap, uh, who is the one connecting emotionally with the audience? And when, like I said, when you go back and to me, when you look at DX, I mean, Brian jumps off the page. He's got his stick there. The sing along is with Brian stuff. The, the quick witty stuff and look Vince working firsthand with folks backstage or whether it was Russo or Bruce or whoever it may be, you know, you know, or K Dick, Kevin Dunn or anybody, his crew is, you know, when you hear it enough, damn, that road dog's talented. Damn that rogue's dog talented. Damn. He's talented, man. He's creative. Did you hear the reaction? Did you hear this? Oh man. You know, all the kind of positive momentum you start building. The natural deal is let's not wait to the tag team wears out. Let's be, take a chance. You know, um, when things are down and out in business, you better change. It's the ones when things are going good that you kind of take a gamble and go, it's good. Can I get it even better? And I think that's kind of the mentality that Vince would have is Brian's hot in this tag team. Can I get him hotter? And they did. We're going to talk about it. Let's, um, Let's talk about what happens at backlash. It's the new age outlaws wrestling Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett. Uh, new age outlaws are going to get the win after 10 minutes and 32 seconds. Billy Gunn is going to pin Owen Hart here and they become the number one contenders and road dog said he didn't want to see them, but on behalf of the crowd, he wanted Deborah to show everyone her puppies. Billy Gunn gets all excited. Jarrett pulls her aside, refuses to let her do it. Gunn then mooned Jarrett and Owen, at which point the bell rang to start the match. At about eight and a half minutes, Gunn gets the hot tag and gets a near fall on Jarrett. When Gunn clotheslines Jarrett over the top rope, Road Dog encourages Deborah to show her puppies. Owen attacks Road Dog from behind. Owen flies the sharpshooter. Gunn gives him the famouser, and scores the pin. It's, uh, according to the torch, a three star match that was a well executed tag match that never dragged and a couple of times caught fire. You guys had chemistry together. I mean, I'm sure it's because y'all were all tight. How did Deborah fit into that equation, that equation of, you know, being the, uh, the woman on the outside, if you will, you know, the dynamic of the, and look, Brian is the one who named the puppies. It was his creative, uh, that, you know, again, that if you can't say piss on TV, man, folks, it's so interesting to look back on during this time that we were pushing the envelope on everything, but Monday night football ratings and raw ratings and, you know, just even WCW, just the business red hot. But as far as kind of the, the politics of wrestling, oh my gosh. I mean, you know, I think I've told you a story that, you know, in my church, people were offended at different things going on. I'm like, Hey, this, you realize this is scripted, but it was just the attitude era push people's buttons in ways that it had never been pushed obviously prior to social media. So, 
you know, Howard Stern shock jock stuff and other stuff like this. But now all of a sudden it, it's in, you know, on professional wrestling and the ratings are through the roof. And so Brian can't say, you know, what, what might be said on a Cinemax channel, but he's naming her breast, if you will, and how the people responded to, you know, even the, the, the young guys in the audience, oh, we're saying something in puppies that we're not supposed to be saying. So that dynamic that was had by all five of us that look, it was kind of clear that, that what is the relationship with Deborah? Deborah, is she, you know, managing both of them? Because there was never any love interest between me and Deborah. There was never any betrayal. There was none of the the traditional storytelling. Uh, it you know it was it you know we're going to win matches, and as things rolled along, that's how the Attitude Era story was kind of told. And Brian was the catalyst to all of that, every bit of it. So the chemistry worked in so many ways because you know Brian in his character, maybe he wanted to see the puppies, but badass Billy Gunn, he's like, ah, screw it. Suck it. You know, he, it just, there was a good dynamic between the five of us. I, um, I want to encourage everybody to go watch this backlash 99. First of all, it's a great tag match, but sadly, this is the last pay-per-view match that Owen's going to have. And you know, you're running wide open. So I'm sure eventually it all just starts to run together. But with the benefit of hindsight, that makes it even more special all these years later, doesn't it? Uh, when I look at this era, uh, obviously the accident happened in May of 99. Uh, mania this year. Um, what number would that have been, Conrad? Uh, 99 would have been 15. In Philly? Yep. So when you just kind of look at, that's when me and Owen... Um, Correct me for how it does run together. We defended the tag titles at Mania, correct? Against Kane and X Pac. Help me out, Conrad. They they are running together. Mania 15, Philly. Uh, yes. Cause Yeah, it's 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 D Lo Brown and Test uh that are taking on you and Owen. Okay. And we, 15. Okay. So just during this, so what I almost say from you know, me and Owen got to put together early this year just kind of not only the fun we were having off camera, but on camera. Uh, and I know this episode about raw dog road dog, and I, I'll, I'll circle back on that, but man, a, an absolute blast because our chemistry clicked the the team clicked. Like I said, with, 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 with Deborah and how it kind of fit the attitude era. And then we were kind of weaving over here a little bit of the blue blazer story, but then the, it, at the end of the day, Jeff and Owen were really just playing Jeff and Owen on TV. And it, it just worked. And, you know, April, I certainly didn't think of, of 99. Oh, this is going to be his last tag match. How grateful I am today that, you know, um, I, I, I can reflect upon April as opposed to May uh, and, and just all that. But, you know, still hard to believe in a lot of ways. Uh, I know at AEW, we have the uh, Owen Hart Foundation and Martha and the Cup coming up and all that. Uh, and it's really cool, you know, all these years later, we get to uh, introduce Owen to a whole new audience. But, you know, the, the, his final pay-per-view match, uh, pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to circle back to that mania. The reason I was trying to connect the dots, here's a little footnote, a little trivia note of just how hot the road dog was. That WrestleMania in Philadelphia, and we were on, you know, I remember at the end of the night, and I'm not sure if Austin was going to the ring or where we were out on the card, but I had already wrestled and dressed. Jimmy Miranda walked by me and he uh, has passed away since God rest his soul. Great dude. I asked him about, Hey man, how's business got to be big. And you know, I would always ask what's the per head or what are you thinking? And this and that. And he said, Oh my, your boy, double J. And I'm like, what? He goes, the number two seller, the absolute number two seller in all of merch in Philadelphia that night, obviously Austin was number one, but Brian was number two. That's how hot he was as a single. So I say that the chairman was right. VKM was right. He got over as a single star. Well, I'll tell you who else is right. Athletic greens, man. Jeff and I love us some AG one. We start every single day with AG one. 
because we know with one delicious scoop of AG one, you're getting 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, literally everything you need to start your day. Right. It's a special blend of ingredients to support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, your recovery, your focus, your aging, all of the things. Fun fact, Jeff Jarrett started taking AG one, got an AEW contract. Now he's wrestling on pay-per-view for gold. How can it affect your life? Well, try the shit and let's see it's lifestyle friendly. Whether you eat keto or paleo or vegan or dairy free or gluten free, it checks all the boxes. Less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial anything, and it still tastes good. It's going to support better sleep quality and recovery, better mental clarity and alertness. Think of it as like your all in one nutritional insurance. And you know, it's the real deal. These cats have over 7,000 five-star reviews. So reclaim your health, arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash my world. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash my world to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutrition. Hey man, let's talk about it. You know, uh, Hulk Hogan had his uh, vitamins. He'd say, say your prayers and take your vitamins. I mean, I guess for you. It's uh, say your prayers and take your AG one. No Conrad got to tell you a little AG one story. You ready for this? I'm ready. Uh, not last week, but whatever it was two weeks. Yeah. A week and a half ago, uh, land up in Baltimore and you know, I had a work day. I was headed to the Briscoe farm to get a little work done. Right? Sure. <sighs> a tag team partner, none other than Jay lethal. We get in the car. Riding, I picked, we met at baggage claim. We're headed down there and I got up early in Nashville. I'd already had my AG one early, but I pack it. It's, I take it every morning. Literally it is a part of my daily routine, but all of a sudden we're riding. Jay gets out this shaker, you know, Jeff, I got to drink this on an empty stomach. And I'm thinking, what the heck is he, you know, I, I was kind of impressed to, to say the least. Jay's getting all nutritious on me on here. Sure enough. He pulled out his AG one and I said, man, oh man, AG one is going mainstream, but yes, it is. Uh, it is, you see AG one advertised everywhere. And that just tells me that again, Connie was on it first. You're a trendsetter, but no, the product is fantastic. My daughters have asked me cause they know I'm a little peculiar and I've got, I keep it in the fridge, uh, uh you know, keep it cold and everything. And Hey dad, can I have a scoop of that? And so I said, girls, I have doubled up my monthly order. I encourage you to take it every day. So yeah, I'm, I'm on it, man. I, I, uh, yes, it is. I, I, here's what I believe. Yes. It's cellular health and I get it, get into all this, but I I'm a big believer on gut health. I think gut health is, uh, paramount to long-term and I'm not talking about colds and allergies and all that, which I do think it helps. I'm talking about disease, our bodies. It's like our, you know, if you really drill down into it, our, our bodies on, in a, on a certain level rust. Okay. They, they just, just what happens in, in our, our innards, if you will, they rust and disease forms. Well, a product doesn't rust. If you keep it lubricated and all and cared for an AG one on the cellular level. I'm getting way too deep here, Conrad. I'm sorry. That, no. That's what I truly believe AG one on the very cellular level keeps us super healthy. And so it's, it actually tastes good, but some folks say, Oh, I can't drink that. It tastes bad. I've heard that around my house for years. No, it doesn't. Anyway, on the cellular level, AG one, I believe is a part of the secret sauce for old last outlaw. Hey, it works. Try it. And it tastes great. It's athleticgreens.com slash my world. That's athleticgreens.com slash my world. Let me just tell you, if we know for sure that Jay lethal and Jeff Jarrett are taking this stuff, FGR doesn't stand a chance. Come double or nothing. Uh, Sunday night heat is July 18th, 1999. And this is going to be in Lexington, Kentucky. And as far as I know, your last match with the road dog here in the WWF road dog gets the win by DQ. It goes a whole minute and 32 seconds. 
The announcers do their best to stress your mean streak and late in the match, Deborah's going to try to distract dog by removing her shirt. He doesn't get distracted and winds up getting the win. Uh, and in the end you try, he tries to hit you with the uh, title belt. You pull the ref in front and you're disqualified. It's crazy to think though, that this is it for you guys. No more matches together in the WWF. I still think there was a missed opportunity. I wish we could have had a long, sustainable singles feud based on the old stuff from 95, but man, road dog, he was on his way to the stratosphere here. Well, you know, I hate to talk about less than awesome stuff. Cause we've put over how popular he was, how much merch he's selling. And we know for sure my man was making a bunch of money and he's been pretty out front about maybe he was having too much fun. Were you seeing signs that maybe he was having too much fun here? So I, I, before I, you know, yes, of course, but you know, this is BS. So before sobriety, I, I did the, the red lights weren't going on like too much fun. Like, dude, that guy can go. <laughs> I mean, that guy, I mean, he, he was unbelievable. Um, tolerance level. I'll say that, but here's kind of something that, you know, as, uh, the, the old adage of my world, Oh, I hated his guts until I hated his guts until all that kind of stuff. The, the narrative that, you know, I held Vince up and the peace shirt and all that kind of stuff. But we're talking about my last match. So Conrad in September of 99 into October, but we'll back up into August. I'm IC champ. The character is red hot. I'll, I'll just as diplomatically and as humbly as I can say a ton of steam. And yes, the storyline was written, you know, Miss Kitty and Deborah and it look had China not been on the other side of the fence. She's the perfect opponent for this male chauvinist. Things were just clicking, but the idea of my contract coming up and me not feeling it was not a good situation. The negotiations went, you know, I'm not saying they went bad. It was just a incredibly low ball offer. And I'm just like, I wasn't even getting back up to the level that I came in at, uh, you know, two years prior, it just wasn't going good. And I got it. The politics, everything. The last thing I wanted to do, I'm talking about in this September month and October was leave. It wasn't too, and we've documented this. It wasn't until, you know, mid October or, or early October when I contacted JJ Dillon. Uh, but, uh, me and Brian were working together every night, whether it was singles or tags or six mans traveled all the time, traveled everywhere. And yes, you know, this is in that era of Woodstock 99 with kid rock bus and all that. So we were running very, very hard, uh, working all the time, but having an absolute blast both in and out of the ring. And so your question was that I think he was, I think he said partying too much or pushing it never entered into my brain. It's kind of what we did. He did his thing and I did my thing. And you know, uh, the silver bullets were endless in these days. You know, I don't want to, uh, to glorify, uh, bad behavior, but I'm sure some fun stories, uh, happened. I don't know how much of that you can share. Is there a, a podcast friendly, fun, silly story from your party and days with road dog you can share? Well, that, I mean, when we, I mean, I've, I've told it on here before we we're uh, wherever we were headed back to Cleveland and kid rock had just done Woodstock 99 and we randomly pull in a, a truck stop slash gas station for us to get gas and kid rock and his bus are there and Josie and all, all this. And we end up being all on kid rocks bus as he goes back to Cleveland. Um, and, and, and you know, and, and we get off and our rental car is an hour back toward Pittsburgh or up the road or wherever it was. I mean, we were living life and loving every minute of it. And, you know, there's story after story after story. Um, we just had a blast. I mean, it was, um, you know, uh, it, when I kind of look into it, uh, me and Owen traveled a lot together up to his passing. And then you kind of look from June, July, August, me and Brian were sharing a room the night 
uh, of Owen's passing. And, and then you kind of get into June and, and July and August. And then, you know, me and Brian rode together to the building uh, in Cleveland that day uh, that was my ma last match against China. And so, uh, you know, just being together and, and uh, the business was red hot. So we were all making money and having a blast, but you know, the kid rock stories, first ones that really comes to my mind, but uh, there were some crazy stories. Yes. Let's uh, remind everybody that later in this same year, the outlaws have officially broken up. You're going to leave the WWF for WCW after you put that P shooter and Vince's belly. Uh, <laughs> are you still in touch with, uh, with road dog when you're making the jump or at this point, was he more of a quote unquote work friend? Oh, I mean, yes, we were still in touch, but I mean, we were both living that lifestyle. So did we call each other every day? No, but we definitely stayed in, in contact. I mean, it was just, you know, it, it, we were buddies, but he was doing his deal. Uh, and I was doing my deal and look, I, I can remember he was still, I don't say in disbelief because I was, you know, a little perplexed, like, okay, it's really over. I'm going to nitro tomorrow. It was bittersweet. Um, but, but Brian, um, you know, there what was, what do you think of that? What do you think of you holding up Vince McMahon with a gun? Yeah, no, he, 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 he wasn't real happy about the lack of negotiate. He wasn't happy with my negotiations either is the easiest way to say it. He was frustrated with Jim Ross. Yes, he was. Okay. Yeah. And you know, him and Jim had got a unique relationship because I think take Jeff out of the equation, they've gone at each other a couple of times through the years, you know, that's water under the bridge, but yes, he was not happy with Jim. Uh, of course, dog is not long for the company. Uh, DX is dead. He's going to bounce around teaming up with X-Pac and he's suspended in December of 2000 for showing up to work in no condition to perform. And they fired in the following month, January of 2001. You're still with WCW. You're the ch -ch 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 chosen one mm -hmm. in this era. Are you in touch with him trying to see, Hey man, can you pull the nose up and come to work over here? Or is he calling you or what's that look like? He talked. I don't know who called. I'm sure it doesn't matter. We talked, but the non-compete, I, I, I knew that, you know, that was unexpectedly. He, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, in Brian fashion, Hey dude, I effed up, but I'm good. Uh, I'm fine. I'm at home. Let's just see how life plays out. You know, it wasn't any, I mean, he was contractually, he wasn't going anywhere. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, the last nitro. As I understand it, he comes to the last nitro with you. Is that right? So Panama city, well, you know it better than I do. Brian's over at Gulf breeze. He didn't come with me, but he, you know, that last, I, I think. So Nitro, obviously on a Monday, I think I went down, we finished, uh, whatever the Nitro was. I came home on a Tuesday. I either left Wednesday night or Thursday night. And I was down there like four days. I know I had media and, or whatever appearance and all that, but you know, I called Brian and I'm like, Brian, how far are you over? He came over one night, then went back. And then one night he came over, um, uh, club La Vila. I, I thought he's going to fight everybody in there. Uh, kind of kind of a bad scene if you will uh but yeah i mean we hung out together. How, so? how so give me some context oh just what do you think loud boisterous too many cocktails uh you know it's spring break uh there's how many places that people hold a thousand in that nightclub two thousand oh, maybe, maybe more yeah thousands it's, it's packed you, you know and so uh, you know, somebody show attitude, whatever it is. And Brian, <laughs> little military in him, little James game in him, little, uh, you know, Joe, uh, some go, go juice in him. It wouldn't take two seconds to him fire off and cuss somebody out. So, you know, if there was never a fight, never, uh, the cops called, but plenty of bouncers were, Hey, Jeff, Brian, why don't y'all, take y'all's party, you know, maybe back to the room or, or, or maybe to the next club, or you just can't be here. You got to go. 
You two wrestled each other a bunch on the WWE tours of Australia and the UK in late 2001, which we covered out on our WWE episode available now in the archives, my world on youtube.com. But in early 02, dog is scheduled for the world wrestling all-stars pay-per-view debut in America, but he doesn't show. And it comes out in the observer that he was arrested for a probation violation in Pensacola. My man's got to be under house arrest for the next six months. And at that point forward, TNA had been announced. So listen, he's your pal. I'm sure he's one of the first people you thought of. What were you thinking about road dog when you're starting TNA? I remember hearing that news and I didn't talk to Brian for a couple of days, maybe because it was, that was a really, I'll let Brian speak to, but it was a dark period in his time. When I heard that, I'm like, oh boy. That is some serious legal issues. Um, not just, it, again, I had no context on the disease of addiction, substance abuse issues, like the real practical thought process that that I now go through. Back then it was, he's partying too much. Uh, and that's really the extent of it. But when I heard the legal issues, I'm like, oh boy, that ain't good. Uh, and so, you know, um, I knew just how serious it was. Uh, but as far as, you know, starting up TNA and looking at the available talent up there, uh, out there or the potential to get out there, um, I've said it so many times, Brian checks every box charismatic. He knows how to put a match together. Um, he can do a promo. He could be a healer, or baby face. He can help others. He knows how to think through a match and not just worry about himself, but literally every player he thinks through his brain on. And I was telling this somebody the other day, when you're doing things in the ring and, and, and timing and laying things out, think through your brain, what will the announcers hit on at this point? Or what would you like for them to hit on Whether right. it's a story or a callback or whatever it may be? Brian um, is just great at it. So from the very first chicken scratch roster, or, or even people that I wanted a part of TNA, Brian was on every list, every list. On September 18th, this is the 13th pay-per-view for TNA. It's going to feature road dogs debut. You're going to be in the ring and challenge bullet Bob Armstrong, and then go backstage looking for him. You're going to find Bob and shove him. And then a masked bullet attacks you from behind, drags you to the ring. And then he says, oh, you didn't know. And he reveals that it's actually road dog. Or as today called him Brian James, and he admits he's blown up. And Meltzer would say he looked to be in terrible shape with a huge gut. His haircut also took away a lot of his star power. James said he walked out of the WWF once with Jarrett and almost committed career suicide. He then rebuilt his career as part of DX, although he isn't proud of everything he's done. He's got a haircut and had a change of heart. He's going to find himself a partner. He said his mother named him Brian G. James. So now he's BG James and the G stands for get it, got it good. Chat me up. What'd you think about, uh, this promo, this debut and you get to see Brian, he's back, but he looks a little different. I couldn't you. believe when I did the research that he was, TNA was only four and a half months old in my brain. I had it. He was there year two. I mean, but he yeah. was four and a half months in, he came again. That, that kind of is a tip to, yeah, I wanted him on the roster. I do remember the conversation of, Hey Jeff, I ain't got my braids in. Cause he knew how much I, I thought that really, there was just something about the charismatic look of, you know, a, a big dude, six, four, that has got it's crazy hair. It's different. Crazy hair and a, and great rhythm and great cadence. It just kind of fit Brian so much. And he's like, I don't have them. I know you like them, but I ain't got them and I ain't getting them. And he might even slid in there. Jeff, they're too damn expensive to put in, you know, because Brian had a, you know, his, his life, uh, you know, we'll both tell you just his bright, his, his life, uh, you know, he was coming out of a real dark period. Uh, right. but, but, um, but yeah, no, no, no braids, but he could always talk. Uh, and just that little line that, that, uh, self-deprecating Brian has a way of, Hey, I'm real blown up or I'm this, or I may yeah. not, 
you know, come out of Gold's Gym or his ability to self-deprecate makes him so endearing to the audience. There is a real lesson there. If any uh, young wrestlers are listening to that, it's the authenticity of Road Dog that I think is part of his recipe for success. September 29th, you're going to lose to Brian by DQ in nine minutes and seven seconds. It's billed as the main event of the pay-per-view. It goes two and three quarter stars. Before you know it, Brian Lawler, Elix Skipper, uh, Scott Hall, Sean Waltman, everybody's here involved. So it's uh, lots of former WWE guys. And then he does a, an interview on the TNA website that is going to talk about his drug issues and they recap it on the torch. And he says that he was a slave to drugs in recent years, quote, the party, it had caught up to me and it's always right there. It's always like a lion, just waiting to attack. It's always there. And it's a constant battle, a daily battle. I'm a drug addict and there's no hiding that I've been in a drug rehab center for drug addicts. And it was actually called Christian based. And I've been born again and given my life to Jesus. I try to live every day now, just like God's watching me and do what would be pleasing to him. Actually, it's not that hard. You just kind of got to be good. And that's not that bad. I don't know what I was. I was actually something and that's just slavery. That's just bondage. That's no way to live life. There's too much out there to do. And I've got children. I've got a wife. I want to bring my children up. Right. So I'm still in the wrestling game and it's corrupt, but I don't want to live that in my life anymore. I just pray that I stay sober and I hope that everyone else prays. I do too. He said he's back together with his wife. And at one point she had a restraining order put against him and he wasn't even allowed to see his children quote. I think they hit it on the head because I did bottom out this time. I was losing everything I worked for everything that I loved, everything I had, I was losing. And it was because of drugs. The first couple of times I went for other people, I went because Vince wanted me to go or somebody else thought I had a problem. I think they're right. You got to bottom out. And that's what I did. I hit rock bottom and I mean, rock bottom. And I thank God I didn't lose my wife and children. I still got them. I still got my health. And he gets pretty emotional when he talks about being grateful for having his second chance. And he doesn't begrudge WWE for releasing him. And he talks a little bit about his old friends, Brian Pillman and Davey boy, and how they were no longer here. This is, um, this is heavy stuff, but good stuff. And this is years before you're in the same headspace. What'd you think of this and giving him a platform to sort of share his life change? It, you know, that's where Brian was at in his life. Does that have a year on there that, that, that when he said that, cause 2002. Yeah. And, and so he went through another dark period. It, it's just the struggle of the disease of addiction is, is, um, I mean, it's just tough. Um, and, and, you know, when I look back on where my headspace was at, I was, it was hard for me to relate. And in my mind, it wasn't a disease. It was that comment, Brian, you've partied too much and how wrong I was, you know, it just, it, it was the, the, you know, because I think Brian would tell you to this day, uh, I certainly, it is a daily battle. It, 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 it is a daily reprieve. It is not, Hey man, uh, that, that period of my life. And, and now I've graduated, graduated sobriety school and I'm good to go. Let's rock and roll. You know, it's, it is, it is a, um, looking yourself in the mirror every day. Uh, to f really figure out where you're at. Uh, but you know, th these are the early days of TNA and him being again, he's always, that's one of the things from the day I met him, the transparency that Brian has always shown <clears throat> is just who he is. Um, just raw and open and honest. And I think again, not, not only does that endear him to the wrestling fan, but to other humans, you, you, you know, you said earlier how quick witted and charismatic all this he's, you know, unless you're on the other end of a, a jar head cussing out, he's super endearing and, and very, very likable. Uh, but, uh, look, we all have our ups and downs, but yeah, it, it was cool to, and, and as, as you were reading that, I was thinking about how far removed, cause look, I mean, we, 
94, 95, we were together. Then we worked together in USWA, then come back, and we've covered a lot about all this. I mean, the Australian tours, and we went into that in the archives. Me and Brian in, in uh, Sydney, Australia, we had a hell of a match that night. I mean, just our, our careers have been intertwined so much through the years. And during this period, I wasn't, I can't say that I wasn't there for him because Brian will say, hey, man, you gave me a job. But I didn't have context on what really mattered and that's him battling the disease of addiction well he's going to be battling a lot of matches here <laughs> in tna2 six and bg james are going to be taking on jeff Jarrett and brian lawler later we would see six and kurt henning team with bg james against jeff Jarrett, brian lawler and ron killings another time we would see bg james team up with hermy sadler to take on you and bruce uh, which had to be fun. Uh, and then you guys get some singles action once upon a time, uh, November of 2002. This is for the opportunity to earn a title shot. You get the win. Of course you do. Uh, two and a quarter stars, the Raven debut match, which we've talked about, you know, he, he's a part of that. And then three live crew is formed mm. and three live crew. I think criminally underrated. It feels like a super odd couple. It's Conan BG James and and ron killings maybe ahead of their time and and in, eventually in 2004 they feud with you and the elite guard i mean you tried every version of of you and road dog doing battle here what do you think of three live crew it is something that i i would i i, I wish that like on a stage <clears throat> like an AEW or w you know this is wednesday night only pay-per-view with right limited resources, but right. you put a hundred men in a room and say, all right, I want you to, you got three hours and end up, you can pick two guys and end up, you know, pairs of threes. If there's 99 in a room at some point, I truly believe those three would end up together. They naturally got along. They all kind of had the, I don't say the same sense of humor, but they bounced each other off. Their collaboration um, was great. Um, this is, you know, to my knowledge, they all like, hey, let's get together. But, you know, just the crew, he was he was as authentic as possible. Um, I wish we could have done more with it. You said criminally underrated. It was, uh, they just had, uh, again, all three super charismatic. And, you know, it goes without saying what I think about Ron as a worker when he's not, silly ron he's our you know the the truth and and just very 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 talented trio super talented i'll tell you what else is talented blue chew and jeff jarrett's penis boys and girls i can't wait to talk about jeff jarrett's penis with you, you already know about stroke it's a patented move from jeff jarrett you already know about with my baby tonight well you gotta know that the hot tag that double j is looking for it's not one that the road dog can give him. It's only one that blue chew can give him blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. There's no double J's a thrifty son of a gun. Take them anytime day or night. You can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. I have it on good authority that after they finished another product, Jay lethal and road dog both took a blue chew together. Just see what happens just for friends, just for funding. If you don't make eye contact, nothing wrong with it. Now the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part, it's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped to your directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Boing. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. We got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. When you use our promo code MYWORLD at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is MYWORLD, and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast and Jeff's Wiener. Uh, coincidentally, if you take a Blue Chew, man, you can swing that rascal like a guitar. 
start hitting ladies in the head with well maybe don't do that just because jeff did doesn't mean you should uh okay let's talk about uh the trailer park match here in tna they've created a lot of silly gimmick matches you had ultimate x six sides of steel how about a trailer park match it's a hardcore match filled with garbage can lids but it's called a trailer park match what do you remember about working with your old pal in a trailer park match you know uh, what you just said that that's the six-sided ring and uh i, I believe that was um i don't know if that's the asylum where it was but no no you're uh, in orlando by then. that's orlando by then okay but ju- just naming the the instead of a, a, a another hardcore i kind of feel during this era uh specifically the hardcore but we like to you know work it into promos and brian i'm sure uh probably without saying it is he gave some kind of story about let's go you know to the trailer park and what do you find in the trailer park will you find this and that anyway just a creative call but brian uh brian i tell you one thing and you you kind of see it uh, he was the hardcore champion at wwf i think at one time but brian knew how to lay out those matches as well and he ain't afraid to potato you i'll just say that he will knock your ass out if you let him Let's talk about uh, the Time 3 Live crew teams up with Dusty Rhodes and Larry Zabisco to take on Jeff and the Elite Guard and Ken Shamrock. It's a guitar on a pole match. Wow. Memphis and Orlando. There uh, you hey, go. Well, when Billy Gunn becomes available, I mean, you got to think, well, we got to put them back together, right? By default, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because if I remember correctly, Brian either the three life crew had split up because of Ronnie or, or Kato. I, I don't know, but I think it just kind of fit that Brian is available creatively. Billy's available. And again, going back to their chemistry, that was, you can call them the new age outlaws or you can call them VKM. Then the day it's, it's, it's really Kip and Brian, their God given names. They played themselves as a part, almost as a part of DX, maybe an extension of their personality, but that chemistry is undeniable. At lockdown in 2005, BG is going to sub for Kevin Nash when he can't wrestle to team with Sean Waltman and DDP to defeat yourself, Billy Gunn, who's now known as the outlaw and Monty Brown. Uh, and you guys actually wind up wrestling each other a lot uh, on the Indies, even more so than you do in TNA. Um, there's even matches where dog would team with Nigel McGinnis. And, and and Cody Hawk and, and Raven would defeat you and Matt Stryker. And I mean, there's lots of fun, independent time that you guys had, including ring of glory. I mean, just all kinds of fun indie stuff here. Are you guys partying still? And we'll call it the Oh five era. Um, uh, I'd say toned down, but you know, that ring of glory, uh, I believe that was a Russo show. Uh, yes. one- one of his only independent shows, but yeah, that was something, man. And, and, and again, it's really a, a, a blessing just to be able to look at the evolution of independent wrestling, because in this era, independent wrestling, I can't say it was beginning to get traction, but maybe a little bit. I mean, but the thing was kind of the mentality was go get a WWF or a WCW, a, a, a former star and if they're remotely involved in any past storylines, it's even better. So me and Brian, you know, Oh two, Oh three, Oh four, Oh five. And they, you know, we'd been on that WWA, not that that set the woods on fire, but to put Jeff against Brian on an independent card, it just felt better. And I can just remember us, we turned down probably more offers, but even still, it was just, Yes. Hey man, will you guys come work this show? We did it an awful lot. And, and again, a night off for each of us in the ring. Let's uh, mention that, uh, BG and Kip come together as the James gang. And then eventually VKM we've covered some VKM in the past, but really we're just trying to recapture that DX fun, including when they go to the WWE headquarters, they're going to bash DX and bash Vince and Maybe all that wasn't the best idea, but while this is all going on, 
road dog does an interview on the radio and says if him, him and Kip had the chance to get out of their TNA contracts and go to WWE, they jump at the chance. This is your friend. Clearly he's, uh, wishing he made more money and, and was enjoying more financial success. And I get that, but you're trying to wear two hats here, friend and kind of the boss. How, t- how, d- how tough was this with road dog at different times? Look, he didn't say anything on the radio that he wouldn't tell me. He's like, Jeff, dude, I need more money. This ain't working. Yeah. And again, the context, he had million dollar years as DX and I'm right. just, dude, we're, we're, we're just not there. And so I understood. And again, going back to Brian being authentic and transparent that maybe a, uh, maybe if he had to not answer so spontaneously, he may have thought through that answer. Maybe not, but you know, that's how he was. Hey, would you go back to WWE? Damn right. Cause he's thinking, look, Jeff and them TNA, I'm probably making as much as I possibly can. Right. Why does he think that he believed me? Yeah. (laughs) Doesn't mean he still didn't want more money and he had no problem vocalizing that. One of his final matches in TNA is putting over Kurt angle. And then he starts to take more of a backstage role. He's going to be working as an agent and, uh, gets a lot of praise. But then in September of 2009, he gets released from TNA along with Jim Cornette. And it's basically insinuated that he was quote unquote, too, too strongly associated with the old regime. It sounds as if road dog lost his job here because he was friends with you. That's the way it reads to me. What say you? Uh, if you, the, it, it's accurately. I mean, we've covered this kind of multiple times. The, uh, I referred to it. So I don't, the, the Dixie power play, if you will, um, everybody was gone. If you remotely had, and that was something that, you know, months and months later, you know, me and the spike folks would have that conversation and they're like, oh, okay. So that's why that happened. Oh, cause they were held in the dark. They didn't know anything. Right. But yes, Brian. Dutch, Savio, Cornette, Rudy. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a few, but they were gone overnight, like gone. Well, you, uh, you get him to work for ring King and almost immediately he gets an opportunity to go back to WWE. Uh, he is going to wrestle a little bit and eventually become a producer and believe it or not, becomes a head writer for a period of time. When you first met the man, was that something you imagined he would have been able to do? Cause I mean, he ran SmackDown. That's a big deal. Huge deal. Did I always think he had the creative mind without question? Like I said, he gets big picture and he gets macro and micro from character development to entrances. I mean, he would in the impact zone, you know, we all get there. He would always throw in, Hey, what about having nothing to do with his match? He's just a creative guy. That's how his brain works. Uh, you know, as far as being an artist goes without saying his singing voice. Well, that, that's what his, his, the right side of his brain works incredibly well. And that's the creative side. And so never, um, did it surprise me. What I was so happy and proud for is, is that he obviously, Cause he used to say early when we got together and then, you know, th- through the years when we were working together, he'd say, Jeff, you handle the business. I'll do this over here. You know, he, he and I get aggravated sometimes. Oh, Jeff, you, you're, you know, you do the business. I'll do this. Brian's a hell of a businessman. He, he just is. And so, you know, you hear, okay, he went from a producer. Oh, that's great to, okay. Then he went from producer. He's doing something with rehearsals. Oh, no, no. He runs rehearsals, which is a big, big, big deal. It's something that is, and I say rehearsals, I'm not talking about move for move. I'm talking about music and entrance and the show and this making sure production gets the right shots. It's not move for move in each match. Don't, don't take that. It's, it, it is truly the television aspect of it, but Brian is fantastic at that. And then the next thing you know, he's, worked his way up a little bit more. And then yes, he is the lead writer, head writer of SmackDown, a broadcast show. And so his talent level has always been there. And for him to get to do that, it was really, really cool to hear that. I mean, incredibly cool. 
let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what's next for you in this era. Who would have guessed you were going to go into the hall of fame and who better to induct you than the road dog and running around singing the song. I mean, this is fun stuff here. This has got to be not just a career, but a lifetime highlight. No. And I, we've gone into it, so I won't go too deep into it, but October 23rd, I got sober October 25th, 2017. So October 23rd, uh, obviously my life is in shambles, not a relationship truly existed, just business, personal, you name it. And, um, I went down to the dock right behind me, Conrad, and I've told this, but you know, whatever Brian said to me that day, because I was, you know, what we do, what active, uh, alcoholics do ranting and raving. And, you know, it was not a good day for me, but whatever he told me, um, or said to me or listened to me, I walked back up the hill. And I had, uh, I said, let's roll. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to treatment. So from October of 2017, fast forward to the first Sunday of 2018, when I get a call from the WWE offices about being inducted. And at the end of that call, Hey, we're thinking road dog is the only guy to induct you. What do you think? Cause we want to do whoever you think. And I'm like, there's only one guy. And he said, uh, will you call him? And I'm like, absolutely. So Brian was traveling and in the Atlanta airport, when I text him and I said, Hey man, can you talk? Uh, got something important now, you know, I'm four months sober and or three and a half months, but just barely he he's like, Oh boy, what is this? So he's like, yeah, I can talk. Uh, let me get off this plane. I'm changing planes. So we talk in the Atlanta airport and I said, Hey, Brian, I'm going to make this quick. I know you're traveling. You good, Jeff. Oh, well, I got a little news. And when I told him, you got to know Brian, but when I told him, Hey, I just got a call. They want me, uh, uh, to be in the hall of fame <laughs> and Brian's words. Like, what did you say? He said, and his exact words were like, who you, <laughs> because it all happened so fast. And so he's like, hell yeah, I'll call you tonight to get to wherever I'm going. So that was a, he's a huge part uh, of my life. And so from October to that January call to what we got to do on stage in new Orleans, you know, when I look at how they do the hall of fame now to then, you know, it was, it was a standalone event. Tickets sold, um, you know, I don't know, six, seven, eight thousand people in the New Orleans Smoothie King Arena. Um, for us to get to sing that song, and I've referenced it that, you know, me and Brian, to use his terminology, I'd been, you know, in a foxhole with him in the darkest part of my life, and he was there with me. And now look at us. So, Conrad, it, you know, and I know, you know, our relationship now, but, but, and, you know, with Cassio and all that, but just kind of the entire history from 94 and even going back to that, our dad's working together territories, Bob Armstrong was on my father's very first card when he broke away from Nick Goulas. So the Jarrett's and the Armstrongs go back years and years and years, but to kind of see our life history in the hall of fame deal was to me, only God can write that story. It came full circle, man. In 2019, you wind up working a short program with Elias dogs in your corner. You guys get to sing with my baby tonight. Uh, and then even, you know what, last year or year before you guys did the whole jobs, I guess it was last year, did the whole job switching thing. And <laughs> he worked with us at, uh, Ric Flair's last match. He sort of ran the show from behind the scenes. And I know you guys are, are big friends today and. I'm glad we got to talk about our pal, Brian James, a little bit today. Uh, Brad Stanton has a question. I don't know. It's going to get everybody talking because on road dogs podcast last year, he said, I was a better sports entertainer than Bret Hart. Oh, goodness. Bret Hart. Of course he admitted, oh, hundred times the wrestler I was, but I was probably a better sports entertainer. So here's the question. Brad wants to know who's a better sports entertainer. 
you or Road Dog? Without question, there is. I'd love to debate it with anybody who wants to step up to the plate. But the road dog, Jesse James, is a better sports entertainer than Double J. And a lot of other people. Uh, Next week, we'll be back talking about Global Force Wrestling. We'll pick up where we left off. I'm so excited to continue that conversation. Oh, boy. By the way, you get all these shows early and ad free. As a matter of fact, you can even be a part of our live studio audience. Man, we had a sellout out the curtain today. Brian was here and Richie Ray and Eddie. And uh, certainly appreciate everybody stopping by. Shout out to Lindsay. And and it's a who's who. Coach Rosie and the whole gang was here. Love it. And uh, you get to be a part of these. Shout out to Go ahead. Sorry. Adfreeshows.com. By the way, if you want to advertise here on the program, no better place than advertise with Jarrett.com. If you're looking for men, 25 to 54 years old, boy, we got them. And we got them on social too. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at my world pod. And be sure to check us out on YouTube, my world on youtube.com. And of course we got all the Jeff Jarrett swag. You can possibly imagine, get yourself a new piece of merch, including the brand new grass outlaw shirt available now at boxagimmicks.com. The grass outlaw. If you find yourself, uh, mowing the lawn this summer, you need to be sporting that. Uh, Maybe it's not time for the summer and no worries. Maybe it's time to be the grass outlaw. Jeff, I don't know what I expected today, but I had a blast as I always do. And uh, I'm looking forward to it because as I understand it, Monday, you're getting business internet. Oh, folks, thanks for your patience on the last two years. (laughs) I'm fired up. It's going to be fun next week. Coming at you, talking all things Global Force Wrestling right here on my world. Peace. Hey, this is Cash Wheeler with FTR, a.k.a. one half of the greatest tag team of all time, saying go right now, savewithconrad.com, and I promise you, you won't regret it. If I could say take advantage of one thing with First Family Mortgage, it is the knowledge that they have, because they have knowledge far beyond just the loan process, and they can help you out with all of that. That's how confident I am is working with these people. Like, I'm going to keep buying, and I'm going to keep going back. Savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! Fight Plus is the ultimate digital platform for live sports and entertainment, and they're now offering a free seven day trial at tryfight.com. Fight Plus is packed with a premium live event schedule, over a thousand hours of live action every year, and a library of more than 4,000 hours on demand, plus exclusive content you can't get anywhere else. Fight is a great partner of ours. They support us, so let's support them. Give that free seven-day trial a shot, and you'll be a member for life. That's tryfight.com. T-R-Y-F-I-T-E dot com.